I prefer the east to the west. Its sights and its sounds. In the desert, every newcomer is an enemy till you know him to be a friend. We believe she is a British spy. Her travels should be prevented. She knows more about the Arabs and Arabia than almost any other living Englishman or woman. We rushed into this business with our usual disregard for a comprehensive political scheme. The truth is that I'm in a minority of one in the Mesopotamian political service, yet I'm so sure I'm right that I would go to the stake for it. Oil is the trouble, of course. Detestable stuff. No, one could not say that she was popular outside the small circle of highly placed people in which she moved. Not very like a woman, you know? Do you know what I really want is a wife to look after my household and my clothes. I quite understand why men out here marry anyone who turns up. <laughs> the Arab prince and the English woman, who were trying to build up a new Mesopotamia between them. You may rely on this. I'll never engage in making kings again. It's too great a strain. I have never wavered in my belief that she came to her end by her own deliberate act. Don't tell anyone that the me they knew will not come back in the me that returns. Perhaps they will not find out. Guys, give it up one more time for these people right here. Give it up. Thanks so much for being here. Congratulations yeah. on this film. Uh, it's beautiful, it's an incredible story, but first and foremost, let's just say what an achievement this is for you guys as creators. We were talking backstage, I said this is some incredible archival footage that you have here. I said how long did it take? He said five years, no big deal, five years. So let's talk about when you first had the idea for this film and when you realized it was gonna take five years and what that realization is like. Well, the, it originally started that we actually had worked together on another film uh, about a trailblazing woman. That film was called Ahead of Time, and the woman was Ruth Gruber. And we both individually had read the biography called Desert Queen by Janet Wallach, which is about Gertrude Bell. And Herzog just made into a film with Nicole Kidman, right? Uh, yes, not based on... He didn't take that biography, there's another one that sort of is more along the line of his exploration. I have not seen it, so I cannot attest <laughs> to its authenticity or, any, or, or quality. Yes. Um, and, and so one day we were uh, at the apartment of Ruth, and we were, and I, Ruth had spent quite some time in the Middle East, and so I asked her, did you ever hear of Gertrude Bell? And Ruth was, no. And Ziva said, oh, I just read the biography. And so we said, wow, wouldn't it be great sort of to follow up on this trailblazing woman with another very, very trailblazing woman that is, you know, complex and controversial and has so many interesting parts to her story. So that sort of set us off. Well, talk about uh, Gertrude Bell and how she was a trailblazing woman. I mean, she was really the only woman in this area who had autonomy and was and and was actually doing things with the British government how did she find herself there well she was trailblazing in so many different ways she was the first woman to get uh, honors uh, in modern history at Oxford which they would call a first at Oxford she was the first person to climb many peaks in the Alps she really had, her whole life was being the first and the only woman. She was the first British military intelligence officer. So really the way she found herself in the Middle East in this position of power was she took a series of trips beginning with going to Persia in the 1890s um, because her uncle was the ambassador, the British ambassador to Persia. And she really fell in love with the Middle East and... She then, after a series of other travels, got back to Jerusalem and then traveled up through Syria and 
based on these early travels at the turn of the century, British military intelligence recruited her to help them um, with tribal notes and maps and charts during World War I. And so she worked with Lawrence, T.E. Lawrence, also known as Lawrence of Arabia, in the Arab Bureau in Cairo, and then went to Iraq, where she established the Iraq Museum and helped draw the borders. Yes, and she was fluent in all of those languages, which was very crucial for her getting the job, because obviously the base of her interactions was talking to people and, and enjoying their presence and exchanging ideas. And, and, you know, that was also one of her very unusual ways that set her apart from other people, that she really encountered these um, the, the different tribes on the same level as they were. She never tried to dress up as a, you know, in Arabic clothes. She always kept her Victorian outfit and her uh, Victorian presence. And that sort of created a really equal level respect field between her and her, the people she met. Yeah, She traveled very differently than you would expect a Victorian to travel. She really, um, she, introduced herself to the people that she met. She was very um, authentically interested in their lives. She was authentically interested to know about them. And she started these travels in 1900. Now, I have to ask, you know, uh, you, were, you were working with this woman, Ruth, who had, who had been in the Middle East, been, been in Iraq, and she had never heard of Gertrude Bell. And now, it's been quite some time since I saw Lawrence of Arabia. Is she even mentioned in that film? She's not only is she not mentioned, well, there are no women in, in the, the film Lawrence of Arabia, but there is a recent biography of Lawrence called Lawrence in Arabia. She's not even in a footnote. Why do you think that is? Well, actually, another film that sort of refers to her is The English Patient, which probably many of you have seen. And at the very beginning, they refer to the bell maps as he ha who had drawn the bell maps. So it, clearly no one had an idea that it was a woman that was behind those maps. Now, why do you think her history has been, in, in many ways, I wouldn't say it's been washed away or swept under the rug, but it's, it clearly hasn't been talked about, and she hasn't been held into the highest regard, regard that a person whose history you wanted to preserve would be? Well, that's one of the things that was so incredibly astonishing to us, is that as we read more of the primary source material and the documents and the memos and the letters, she was a real powerhouse. She was a real decision maker and a real player. And what was sort of amazing is that we have the notes of meetings that she attended. There were only five or six people total there, and of course she was the only woman. If you look at the memoirs of the men who also attended those meetings, she's nowhere to be found. So if you're going back only so far and not to the original, original documents, you won't find her. It's like, surprise, surprise, misogyny goes back very far. <laughs> well, also one of our advisors, um, uh, Priya Sati at Stanford, had this very interesting comment. She said, um, going out into the desert was always a way to sort of test British masculinity and testosterone. And once Gertrude Bell did it, there really was nothing more for men to do out there. Well, it's, it's so interesting. I say misogyny, but I think I'm using the wrong word. It's about the patriarchy, and it's about this sort of dismissal of, of the woman in the room, who maybe in that moment they weren't dismissing her, but historically or looking back, there is a, whether intentional or not, there is a dismissal of her presence. And it's her... about who writes the history. Exactly. Thank you. And why do you think, why do you think it is that those who wrote the history left, left a woman out? Well, it's I, a softball answer. Really. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that it was the, the ultimate old boys network. You couldn't get more old or boys than the colonials in, in England at that time. I think it's just the same way that women have a hard time getting acknowledged for lots of their accomplishments to this day. Um, uh, it's you know. for once, it's called history, not her story. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's a good turn of phrase there. Uh, so you, you start pouring into Gertrude Bell's life, her letters, essentially, her notes. How much of that did you have to work with? 
Well, she left behind 1,600 letters. Um, they were all at the Newcastle University at the Gertrude Bell Archive. Um, and we really spent hours, months, years reading through all these letters. So, so that was a huge amount. And then we fanned out from her letters to sort of the archives of people that she mentioned and then found their archives and spent a significant amount of time to go through their archives. And then from collecting all these different pieces of narrative, we started building um, the narrative of the documentary. That's unbelievable. So you have five years doing this and going through the archival footage that you, that you found. Where did you find all the archival footage and what was it like going through all of that? Well, that was one of our earliest concerns is that we wouldn't have enough archival footage to make a film because we knew that the film would be primarily archival footage. But it just so happened that the very first phone call we made um, to an archive you know, got us one of the most beautiful clips ever of Baghdad, people in the harbor in Baghdad unpacking boxes. So we, we just jumped in and contacted many, many, over 25 archives all over the world. And of course, we were, had an archival producer, but the bulk of the work in the end after, because it lasted for so many years, was really us refining our search and exploring quirky archives that might not be readily available to the public. Um, but it was a really exciting because some of the footage is hand tinted and it was just gorgeous. And the other thing is, is that we were concerned that the footage would not be in good shape, but we actually also loved some of the emulsion damage because that looks really beautiful. So we approached it sort of the way artists would approach, would use their palette. What, what was your philosophy behind how you use the archival footage in regards to the narrative? You know, like at what point does this image correspond with what someone's letter is saying or someone's testimony is saying perfectly? Is it about sort of being literal or is it about finding sort of metaphorical visuals that uh, complement testimony? It's a, a, a you know, combination of both. I mean, we were, of course, extremely excited when we found footage. For example, there is a piece of one of the very rare sound clips in the film that contains original sound, where actually it's in a group, they're a, a tribal group, the Hawaii Tad, and she mentions them. And so to find that clip obviously was amazing and we wanted to use that in the context of her travel. But then of course there are all these other moments, the more intimate, personal moments in her story, which were very important to us because it, it also creates the arc of the character and the narrative. And so in those moments we would refer to clips that were more evocative, they were, you know, there could be water, close-ups of water, or even a bird, or the weeds waving. They were basically representative of the emotional inner world of Gertrude Bell at that moment. Unbelievable. Um, so much of what Gertrude Bell, actually, sorry, before I even talk about that, since we're talking about the process, we were talking about this backstage, and your casting of actors mm -hmm. to perform the testimony of people who were around Gertrude in that day. Talk about the decision process behind that, because I'd imagine once you move forward on that, that's really a, a courageous sort of step and a real, it's a big decision when it comes to storytelling. Can you talk about making that decision and deciding to, to stick with it? Yes, we decided very close to the beginning of the process that we would want, we would use primary source material and modify it to create interviews that actors would speak. And the actors would be um, in the time period a few years after Gertrude Bell's death. So we sort of in our minds planned that this, would have been, this would, was taking place in around 1929, 1930. And so, and then we sort of structured everything around that conceit. And so for you, the entire documentary was made yes. in 1929. Yeah, you could look at it in that way. Yeah, exactly. And we could, stuck yes. to the rules, really. With the exception of Tilda Swinton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but we, yeah, exactly. we did stick to the rules very religiously. In fact, if there was someone that would not be alive in 1929, 1930, they didn't get to be on camera. Yes, because uh, we would use then letters and, and a voiceover. For example, there is a, a scene where Lord Cromer, who was a friend of hers, actually writes to, uh, to the military um, in Cairo and recommends her highly as the only English man or woman that could act, do this, do the job. And he was dead by the time um, we set our, our limit. Our parameters. Uh, and you shot these interviews on, like you were telling me, 16 millimeter film, right? That you transferred, to, that you then converted to black and white, which is, I imagine, so much fun to do in a shoot. Yes, we really um, to hear the sound of film spooling. It's like an amazing sound. <laughs> well, we were really um, focused on how the film would look, the footage that we shot, and we experimented quite a lot with video because there are all these. Um, you know, lots of people said, well, if you take video and you do this to it, it'll look like film. And if you take video and you do that to it, nothing really felt authentic to us. Mm -hmm. And so we first shot a, a test with black and white, 16 millimeter black and white, but didn't like the grain. And so then we did the shoot with 16 millimeter color because we had more latitude in terms of what the final footage would look like. And we also used as a pattern portraits that were taken uh, in the 1920s in Australia of, um, of inmates of prisons. But they were so beautiful. They're mug shots. Yeah, mug shots. And also some portraits taken when people arrived at Ellis Island. So we had very, very specific ideas in our head as what we wanted things to look like. But part of also using, not just sort of staying in, in the, you know, ha have sort of the texture of the interviews be the same as archival footage, we also are really concerned with film preservation. And one of the ways we raised money for the films, because when we did find the archival footage, we asked the archives to go back into their vaults and find the negatives and rescan the negative. And some of these negatives had never been scanned. Some of them had been scanned a hundred years, or I mean, not a hundred years, but a long time ago. So there was only standard definition uh, video available. So we wanted to do this because we feel that it is important to have a record of this beautiful footage that can then also serve as um, material for other filmmakers to use. And so we started a Kickstarter campaign based on just that aspect and raised the money for that particular aspect. But I wanted to get back to your original question was what, why we made that choice to use the actors. And we really thought about what our goals were for the film and we wanted people to see through the world of Gertrude Bell. We, they, we wanted them to see the Middle East the way she saw it, not solely, because that's why we have other people's voices in the film, but that for that to be a base, we wanted them to enter her world. And we realized that if we had talking head historians, we would blow it. You know, it really just wouldn't be possible. And so that was really what was the main thing sort of driving our decision. I think it works wonderfully and I commend you on your commitment to that idea because it's a rarity, I think especially in documentary, that filmmakers are willing to make a commitment of that size because once you step out on that ledge, you're, you know, it's time to swim. Like. Uh, yes, uh, it was a, a ledge that we, that we felt very acutely when we were trying to raise money. Yes. <laughs> You have to go, you know, jump through hoops to find a perfect word for reenactment. Yeah. That word yes, does not, not fly very word. well with I documentary imagine, filmmakers. Imagine reenactment that we're shooting on film as well. They're like, oh, oh, oh yeah, See sure. Later. Exactly. So we came up with all kinds of other words. Now, one of the things that one of the reasons that it's really important to talk about Gertrude Bell and and, and even Lawrence and, and and World War One and the drawing of the maps in this region is because of really the last. 15 years, 15 years, right, that we've been in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq and in these mm -hmm. wars. And we have essentially, through uh, the creation of new terrorist organizations, have sort of destroyed the map, 
that, that was drawn at this one period of time. These countries still exist to a degree, but the tribal fighting and the nature of these maps as the, these borders has kind of been washed away mm -hmm. to a degree. Was that part of the impetus of, of telling this story as well, to sort of draw attention back to how these tribes and how these countries were originally formed? Well, one of the um, one of the things that struck us, we started the film in 2012, and we started talking about doing the film in 2009. Yeah, it's pre. So it's yeah. it's pre it's pre this. Pre so ISIS. we were yeah. thinking of the parallels between 1917 World War One, British occupy the region, you know, known as Iraq and 2003. That's sort of where we were looking because of course we were looking back. But now there are a whole other set of obviously issues and ISIS destroying a lot of the um, ancient sites Gertrude Bell photographed. I mean it's- That's one of the saddest things watching this, this piece, this film is, is the historic and beautiful sites of these countries that are now completely washed away, not just because of ISIS but because of war in general. Yeah. yeah. What was that like going through all of that footage when you were when you were making this? And I mean, I'd imagine while you were making this, there's like footage coming in from Syria of uh, areas and yeah, Damascus and Aleppo just being well, Aleppo is the last like year or two, but Damascus just being demolished. Um, yeah, no, it was very. Um, I mean, also her photographs really capture these places in, in wonderful ways, and as this, you know, obviously making a film over this course of time as the contemporary um, context changed with ISIS, we also consciously started to include some of the things, just like, for example, Palmyra. We really wanted to show her photographs because it was so much on people's mind that when Palmyra got um, taken over by ISIS. And, and so some of these... Um, places that are mentioned now in the news, we really try to highlight them in the story as well. Absolutely. Let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a microphone that they're holding because they have a question? I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about working with Tilda Swinton. Sure. Working with Tilda Swinton. Sure. sure. We um, were so thrilled to be able to work with her because she was our first choice. And not only does she have the most gorgeous voice, but she actually looks like Gertrude Bell, mm -hmm. you know. She's not on camera, but don't you find that yeah. resemblance sort of Absolutely. surprising? Um, she was real, very collaborative. We recorded her um, near her home in Scotland because that was in our contract. We will record you anywhere in the world. That's convenient for you. She's in like 10 movies a year now. So I would imagine it's like... It's very part, we were le very lucky that there was a moment, a split moment in her schedule that she was available. And she was very smart and just spot on all the time. And just the way you would imagine. Fantastic. Yes, she actually had been cast 10 years earlier in a film about Gertrude Bell, and that film never happened. So she knew of her, and she was very thrilled to be part of a project about Gertrude Bell. So that was one of the advantages we had, too. We approached her with a topic that she was once involved with. That's so cool. Next question. Hi, um, out of the, all the five years you've been gathering all this information, what was the most interesting fact that you found about Gertrude? Uh, stuck out to you? The most interesting fact, I think it was one of the things that really, that sort of surprised us in going through her letters was how dogged she was, how she personally got the high commissioner who was um, a really like nasty person, you know, like did not like the people of the region, she personally got him fired. They basically were trying to get each other fired because we found their letters to their um, supervisors in, in London, and she won. And, she, and the other thing that was a little surprising was that it was very difficult for her to get a space to create the Iraq Museum. It seems so obvious to us now, but she worked for like three years until they had they would gave her a space for all of the artifacts. We, well, another interesting aspect that we found out about her that is 
I mean, obviously she wrote this uh, unbelievable letters, very long, long letters. At some point in her life, she actually wrote a diary and the letters at the same time. So she was really an avid writer, and the art of letter writing is something I think that we're losing. So that was wonderful to work and actually be touching the actual letters. I haven't written a real letter in a decade. Wow. <laughs> yeah. My emails are like texts now. You know? and, They're just like, hey, I need this. Can we do this? Okay, bye. And don't even speak of like a five-page letter or a ten-page letter. <laughs> Never. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Hey, guys. Um, so I was wondering, uh, since, you know, does she have any issues being a woman, like going, th uh, going through the Middle East, um, any clashes with the culture? And also, uh, what drew her to the Middle East besides, like, as opposed to the British Empire? Like, they have different interests, obviously. Well, we feel like she, um, she expressed a lot of freedom when she was in the Middle East. And you have to realize she was born in 1868. And she and Victorian uh, England was heavily, heavily constrained. She had so many restrictions when she was at home. She couldn't go unchaperoned with a man anywhere. This was like a really incredibly different culture. And I think that she felt she came into her own. She was accepted as an equal by the Arabs that she met and the sheikhs that she met. And she has this great line where she says, I am a person. And she felt as though she had a place at the table that she could make a difference, that she was sort of given a voice in the region in a way that she wasn't in England. It's a beautiful film. Congratulations. It's an incredible work. When can people see Letters from Baghdad? How can people see it? Well, we're releasing this coming Friday at the Angelica here in New York and Lincoln Plaza. And then we're here for a whole week, hopefully longer. And then afterwards, L.A., D.C., Dallas, Denver, Santa Fe, so many cities to follow. Amazing. And we're currently playing in the U.K. Oh, thank yes, you. in over 40 menus. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations. Letters from Baghdad, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.